Hi, my name is Art Adams. I'm Cinema Lens Specialist here at Aerie and Burbank, and we're here in the creative space where we've got a little uh, uh, setup uh, to show you some of my tips and tricks around commercial lighting. I was a cinematographer for a long time, and I shot a lot of commercials and corporate projects, and I picked up a lot of interesting tips and tricks, and what's, what I thought was really interesting in my career was um, the, the projects that I shot where I really had to improvise prepared me for what I had to do when I worked on bigger budget projects. So I'm going to show you a mix of projects. I'm going to show you a couple of kind of mid-tier commercials and one kind of larger tier commercials. And we're going to go through the tips and tricks. And uh, you may see some overlap between some of the things that I did. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk basically about my thought process, uh, how I approach these kinds of projects, and um, the kind of environments we're working in now, where budgets are smaller, uh, we have to do more, more quickly. You know, back in the 1980s and 1990s, commercials were, um, they cost a lot of money, and you could do three or four shots in a day, and that was fine. Now it's more like working in episodic television, which I did earlier in my career. Uh, it's, and I think that's fun, because you really have to think on your feet, you have to move quickly. At the end of the day, you may have shot two or three commercials in a day now. It used to be you might shoot one a day, maybe take a couple days, and now you really have to crank them out. But the expectations are the same. You still have to deliver. Fortunately, there's a lot of technology that helps. Uh, cameras are better, uh, especially digital cameras are probably better than uh, film was uh, when I was shooting commercials on film earlier in my career. And we have a lot of lighting tools that really help us out, and we're going to talk about that too. So uh, why don't we go into the first spot. Let's roll the spot, and then afterwards I'm going to do some drawing and show you what I did. Mom said not to open it till Christmas. But it's from Oriental Trading. Just a peek! <laughs> I told her not to open it, Mom. I guess Christmas came early. You're out of milk. <laughs> Let's go to here. So this is the kitchen. So there's a couch and two kids, and there's a camera. And what I did was I basically surrounded them with, with light. Um, these are probably grid cloths because I, I tend to like very thick diffusion. Um, I really like creating big soft sources because you get a really nice specular highlight in skin and in shiny surfaces. And what that means is that you've, you've just got a, a very, uh, you know, if skin is slightly reflective, you'll see the reflection of that, uh, that light in the skin. So you don't just have a bright side and a dark side, you have a bright side, a dark side, and a really interesting highlight that kind of uh, just kind of makes the face glow a little bit. It's a very common commercial trick, uh, and also the way the shadows roll off is really interesting. Um, the big wall of light has been a commercial staple for a long time. Uh, I do it a little differently. I don't just make one... Um, wall, I usually make two because I want to wrap the light around a little bit more. So if I recall correctly, these were 2K open face airy lights, uh, just big, broad, punchy lights. Uh, this one's knocked down a bunch, so it's not nearly as bright. There's a bunch of wire in this one. What this does is I've got a, a key from the side that's very soft and creates the impression of window light, but then this light kind of just wraps it around. So basically, this is my fill light, more or less. I love filling from the key side, because um, what that does is, it, it, if you have a, a bright side, like right here, actually, I'm doing it in this setup. I have a bright side, and I, a key side, and a fill side. And that, that works for a lot of things, and it's fine. But if I had put the fill over here, uh, then I could control how it, this light wraps around, and I would have a bright side I would have kind of a fill area in here, and I'd have a dark side. So I'd actually have more of a transition of tones from one side of the face to the other. Here, I've just basically got bright, dark. So this is why I like filling from the key side, because then you've got bright, 
uh, less bright, and then over here it drops off even more. So it's a nice range of tones, although here in this setup I didn't actually do that. I'm pretty sure I had a fill card over here because it's a very bright and happy commercial. We didn't want the fill side to go too dark. Now, I've created this impression of window light pouring into the space. Uh, it was about 10 o'clock at night, and uh, this is actually the last shot we did. So I wanted to be a little mo more convincing. Uh, when, one thing I learned from one of my mentors is that if you add an accident, like a, a piece of light raking across the set, something that might happen in real life but doesn't normally happen on a set, then it just feels more real. So there's a Leco right here, and it's just projecting a pattern you know, across the, the little girl's lap and her leg, almost as if there's just this stray piece of light just pouring in. It's a little bit too bright, uh, and it's just hitting a random spot in the scene. And that, to me, gives it a little bit more believability. Um, that's something I, I've done a lot throughout my career. I'm really happy I worked with this one DP when I was an assistant who, who did that a lot because it can be really convincing. And there's another, um, another place where I did something like that in the next spot I'm going to show you. So remember this trick. Uh, let's go to the next shot. All right, so this is, this is the setup that we lived in for most of the day. So... Cameras here. Here's the fireplace. We've got the little girl. And then this is now a bounce. It's probably an ultra bounce because I like really matte bounces. I don't like, um, don't use grips too much because grip has a little bit of shine to it. Sometimes that's nice, but usually I just want the sense of light hitting a matte surface and, and spreading rather than a, uh, that spread plus a specular highlight. Uh, it's just a different feel. Um, I tend to like really thick diffusion and really matte bounces, so it's just my personal style. Now, this was at an era where uh, sky panels weren't really common yet, and if I had two or three sky panels, this would have been really easy and I could have shot at much higher light levels. As it was, we had some small Fresnel LED units uh, because I wanted to create the sense of a, of a Christmas tree. And I've always been fascinated by the light that comes off of Christmas trees with multiple colors, even when I was a kid. There's just something about all these colorful sources uh, mixing together, and uh, it's a really interesting quality of light, and I wanted to emulate that. So what we did was we got a bunch of these LED lights, and we bounced them into this uh, ultra bounce, and then we put them on two different circuits, and we had a couple different colors. Uh, there was a, like a warm and a cool. One of them was the base. I think the cool was the base, basically uh, a, a base illumination where uh, when the other lights flashed on and off, I would always have just a, a base level. And I wanted the, not only the light level to change, but also the color to change, because I think that's really interesting. Now, sky panels actually have these kind of lighting effects built in, so I could have put one or two or three of these in there and gotten a much more sophisticated look. But we had to do this off of a, a dimmer board. So not ideal, but it worked, or a DMX controller. It worked pretty well. But the important thing is this stayed in place for basically the entire day until that very last shot. And that's something I've done a lot in commercials, and I think a lot of cinematographers will do that now, is you try to build a look uh, that works for just about everywhere you're going to shoot, in a room or a space, because you want to move as little as possible. Um, I will still move the fill light around more often than not, because you can actually clean up a lot of shots by moving the fill light. It's really interesting. And this fill from the keyside trick I told you about earlier, if I'm doing a shot and the key's in the wrong spot, if I bring the fill in on the same side as the key and just give it a little bit of a wrap around, you can clean up things, especially faces. You can clean up faces very quickly. It's a really great trick. It, it makes everything look good. But in this case, uh, I've got this big broad overall light, and it's working, but the little girl is getting a little lost, and actually that was something I wish I'd been able to do more about. Um, and I wanted to pick her out just a little bit because my eye didn't necessarily go to her right away. So my gaffer saw me staring, you know, sitting and staring at, you know, at the set. And he said, what, what do you need? And I said, well, I really need a, a light coming out of the fireplace. And he said, oh, we can do that. Uh, he had some light ribbon. We put that right here, lit the little girl, gave her a little scratch light, and then put a, two -inch, a piece of two-inch black tape and just ran it down the fireplace. So in this shot, when you see it, um, in the fireplace, there's a... <laughs> 
there's a spot down the edge where, you know, you can't quite see all the way to the back, and that's because there's a two-inch piece of black paper tape hiding this. Uh, let's go to the next shot. And by the way, um, this was, because these lights were so dim, uh, we had to, uh, we basically lit at very, very low light levels. So uh, basically, I think we were shooting at uh, EI 1000 or 1200, uh, probably T2. So um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting shoot. <laughs> it was one of those things where if you look at the monitor, the monitor looks brighter than the set does by eye, which is actually a fun way to work. So if we look at this next shot, we've got mom and dad, and we've got the camera. Now, I didn't want to move these lights. I didn't want to move this setup because I knew we were going to be working with it all day. My gaffer said, hey, can we move this around a little bit? And I said, no, nah, I'd, I'd rather not. Um, so what we did was we just put a bounce card down here with a couple of these lights into it and we just carried it around the corner. Now, the effect you see here, the flashing lights, is this source over here. This is just a bounce card under the camera. And I like lighting from below a lot because it feels very uh, real to me. A lot of light from above, sometimes it can feel a little fake. Um, I think that's just because I saw it so much um, in a lot of you know, old films. You know, they used to light from above. I like to bring the lights lower if I can. And there's always light coming off a floor, especially in a sunlit room where the sun will come in and bounce off the floor and come up into someone's face, or you, you can see the shadows moving up the wall. It's a really interesting look, and it feels very ambient to me. So whenever I'm trying to hide a light, often I'll put it right underneath the lens uh, and make it a big source so the shadows aren't super obvious. Uh, and then the kitchen was interesting because those lights back there are basically the cabinet lights. And I was a little worried about these because I checked them out in advance in the, uh, at the location scout with my color meter and they read a little green. Now, color meters and LED lights don't always work well together. But in this case, LED lights and fluorescent lights almost always have a green spike in them. So I was a little concerned about how this was gonna read and be, mostly because I didn't wanna light that space. Uh, I just wanted to be able to turn those lights on and focus on other things. And for backgrounds, that can work really well. And actually, you really have to do that uh, a lot in, uh, in commercials because oftentimes you don't have enough time to light the background. The background is, you, you always have a background. It's the biggest thing you'll have to light. And if you can just turn on some practicals or put some lights in the shot in the background or use what's there, you save a ton of time. And I love doing that because then I can focus on what's important, which is generally the people and what's going on in the, in the, in the shot. In this case, we turned on those lights and uh, they were a little bit green, but you, it's not distracting. They're not bright green. They're a little yellowish, which usually means there's too much green in the light. So it worked out really well. Uh, let's go on. There we go. Product shots. So product shots uh, really benefit from um, having a big source nearby, especially in this case, you can see there's a lot of shiny objects. This is basically just a frame of, a uh, four by four frame of 129, Lee 129, which is basically plastic tracing paper. It's really thick stuff. Just out of frame, uh, and you can see the nice highlight that you get in all the, the shiny surfaces, and it really makes things pop. What you have to be careful of, though, is if you're lighting small objects, you can kind of overwhelm them. For example, these little, these little characters in the front, um, if you bring that source too close and too frontal, it'll just make them look really flat, and that's kind of boring. So uh, what you want to do is, um, for those little characters, I probably cheated the front of the diffusion back so that if I'm the character, you know, if the edge of the diffusion is out here, it's going to wrap around me and, and it's just going to be a big flat, you know, it's going to be boring light. But by bringing it back around here, I can start getting some modeling back in this little character's face. Another thing I've done, uh, and I do this with, uh, with food, and actually I might be able to get to an example of this later, is I'll, I'll set the frame where I want it, but then I'll also take um, some pieces of black card and kind of come in on the edges of the frame, like just clip them and just move in and out and find where I'm getting the wrap that I want. So, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it's not just as simple as placing a frame of light. You have to kind of maybe shape it. A four by four might not be right. Maybe you want a four by three or four by two, depending on what you're lighting. I think that's it for this commercial. Do we have any other shots in here? Oh yeah, this last one. Um, this is just very quickly, I'll, I'll show you what we did on this one. Uh, oh, I should have left this because this stayed. So we've got all these little lights here. 
They're bouncing back into the scene. Uh, camera's up here on a staircase that we didn't see in any other shots. Here's my stick figure, oh, stick figure mom making snow angels. Um, so it's basically just this light, and then we just added a, a, a light really low just to rake across the snow, because the, the shot needed a little bit of something else. Otherwise, it just felt a little bit too monochromatic for what we were shooting, and it was just nice to have something kind of wash back. And even though it's completely unmotivated, it could be the fire, maybe. If, it, if I'd had a sky panel for this, I could have put on the fire flicker mode and just put it right there and actually got even more interactivity. But I think it helped out pretty, uh, helped out pretty well. So, all right, let's go on to the next spot. If your cat has fleas, you have fleas. Use Advantage 2 monthly on your cat to prevent and treat flea infestations. Advantage 2, fight the misery of infesting fleas. Also available, home and yard products from Advantage. All right, I've tried to draw a cat. It's a terrible cat, I apologize. But uh, actually, the, the flea was sitting on his own chair. Let's just do, we'll just do a little table for the cat. This is why I'm a cinematographer. I'm a terrible artist. All right, so this is an interesting, this was an interesting spot. Um, not very many shots, but each one of them took a lot of time. <clears throat> and the reason for that is because we had a cat. And cats do things very, very, very quickly. Uh, and that's why basically everything with a cat in it gets shot at 48 frames per second. So even though there's, there's not many shots in this commercial, we actually had a fairly sizable crew uh, because we had a lot to do and we had to do it very quickly because then we had to spend most of our shooting time trying to get the cat to do what the cat's gonna do. And actually we had two or three cats with different personalities and they would come out at different times. But each shot is its own little, um, I mean, nearly every shot is multiple passes. So the flea is actually a guy in a fat suit playing the flea. Um, the cat is an actual cat, but they were never on the set at the same time. Let's talk about the lighting first. So out here, we have a couple of airy T12s. T12s are, I don't remember if we had two or three, uh, but uh, T12s are tungsten lights, they're, they're 12Ks. And what's really nice about them is that uh, they have a lot of spread. Uh, traditional 10Ks tend not to, you know, give you a very wide pattern. Um, these do, and we really needed that because the set wall was kind of right there. And I needed to cover a bunch of windows and get this light kind of streaming into the room. So we specifically chose those units because they, they had that capability. Um, inside the room, there's, well, actually just outside the room, there's a, uh, this, in this case, I'm pretty, we had a sky panel. And the sky panel is at, I believe it was at something like 4,300, um, just to make a little cooler for the, because the, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make the fill a little bit different. I wanted to make it a different color. And the idea is that you've got sunlight streaming in through the window, but maybe there's a window over here and it's just seeing skylight. And that happens in rooms. You, you can have sunlight pouring in one side and then skylight coming in the other side. And if you look at the shadows, um, the light bouncing off the floor in one part of the room make it very warm, but then at the other end, you've got skylight coming through curtains or you know, just filling the space, and you can actually have a range of warm and cool within a, the same room. So what I did was I just tried to create a skylit window here, and that's part of trying to make um, spaces feel a little bit uh, more real by doing things that are real or maybe not perfect because on a stage you wouldn't necessarily think to do this, but then you might create something that looks good, but it's missing that little something that makes it feel real. Because you know this is, this is all a set, and we actually had a, a bunch of sets lined up in a row that we just worked our way down over the course of the day. The um, way we shot this, let's see, can I do anything else in there? Um, yeah, that, that's, oh yes, I did. So there's a china ball hidden behind the chair. A lot of the times, if you want to um, pop a piece of furniture off from a wall, uh, you can <clears throat> actually put something behind it. Sometimes I'll take a light and just bounce it in the back of whatever the object is. And if, it's, uh, uh, if there was a red chair there and I, and I wanted to create a, 
a sense of space in the room, I might bounce light off the red chair, create a little red glow in the corner just from the light bouncing off the chair. And then it kind of looks a little different, a little bit more interesting. In this case, that was a little bit too much for what we were trying to do and the chair wasn't a crazy color. So I just put a china ball back there and you can see that little glow behind the chair in the background and it helps pop the chair and the flea out a little bit. Um, you c I could have done this with a backlight, but you know, backlights are kind of out of style now. Uh, if you're outdoors, shooting into the sun always looks better. Backlight always looks better in situations where backlights make sense. But if you're trying to force a backlight into a situation uh, just to get that separation, kind of like what I've done here, <laughs> because I'm against a dark background. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of directors will say that doesn't look real to me. And that's kind of the trend now. There's a lot of people who just aren't um, into backlights. And it is more natural to not use a backlight. In the black and white days, you really needed that because, you know, dark hair against a dark background. By, by eye, the colors may be different, but to the film, everything blended together, and you really need to get that separation. So, uh, actually, why don't, we, why don't we zoom out uh, on this other camera, and um, I'll show you my setup here. So, what I've done is I've got a, a soft key here. I didn't have any 129, so I just stacked two 4 by polyester silks. And I, I can't see the source through that. There, this is just a big glowing wall of light. And that's, like, that's what I like. It's not always appropriate. Sometimes you do want to see the source through there and get a little bit of hard light. But in this case, this is, I, I wanted to give myself as much help as I could. Uh, there's a bounce over here. It's a 4 by 8 It's just leaning against the C-stand. This is just something to get into my face. Um, and, um, you know, I, I use a 4 by 8 vertically because, once again, uh, you know, if you put it up high, then you get a second chin shadow, and I don't like having a key shadow and a fill shadow. I like hiding the fill as much as possible, um, and that's why it's such a big source, and it's also a tall source, so it's kind of getting under my chin, giving me a little bit more help that way. Uh, I try to keep it as close to the lens as possible. A lot of people will put the fill over here uh, because it's the most efficient way to catch light from the key, but then that leaves a dark spot because it doesn't get into this eye. So I always try to keep the fill as close to the camera as possible. And fill placement is really important because if you get the fill in the right spot, uh, you can often clean up faces uh, where you aren't able to clean it up with the key. So if the key is way over here and it's just raking across my face and there's nothing I can do about it because I don't have time to move that big light, if I come in with fill either behind the camera, on the key side, or even just from the traditional fill side and get it as close to the lens as possible, you can clean up a lot of stuff quickly. I was blending a little bit too much into this dark background, so I just added a little bit of white, a uh, white card with a light into it, just to give me a little something. And there's actually a silver card over here that's just catching some of this light off the key and giving me a little bit of something. So when I turn over here, you feel a little presence of something. I really like soft scratches because uh, a hard scratch feels like a light, a soft source, either a, a white card or just a silver card. It kind of tells you, hey, there's something there, and I'm just catching ambient light from it. So not only does it, is it, I think, a more refined look, but it kind of gives you a sense of what the space is like that the person is standing in. It's a little subliminal clue. That, that's, what I, that's the way I think of it. Uh, everyone sees things differently, but I just like reflecting things in people's skin. It just feels more real to me. Uh, now, speaking of this white card up here, one of the reasons I put it up there is because if you're shooting on a set and there's no top on it, it doesn't feel right because all the upward surfaces feel uh, too dark because hair has, for example, shine to it. And if the top of my head is just black, something feels wrong. And this will happen with set pieces and all sorts of other things. There's always a ceiling in a real room and it's always pushing a little bit of ambient light down. And in this setup, we actually had overhead, it was a 12 by 12 ultra bounce, once again my favorite ultra bounce, just sitting there as a ceiling. And if we hadn't had that in there, it would have felt wrong. Now, let me talk really quickly about how we shot this because what we had to do was shoot at 24 frames per second and get the flea's performance. Then we pulled the flea out and then shot a clean background plate for the digital flea to be put in later. Then we took the flea out the trainer for the cat came in and we put the cat in. We shot all this other stuff without the cat, brought in the cat <clears throat> and just brought in the trainer because the cat's attention is all over the place. So you want them to look at one person. So you basically clear the set of everything that doesn't need to be there. Bring in the trainer, 
trainer has a, you know, treats on a stick and then tries to get the cat to do what it's going to do. And uh, by the way, we had to shoot at uh, 48 frames per second for that because once again, when the cat does something, it's only going to do it once and it's going to do it really quickly. And 48 on a cat actually looks perfect. So that's how it all got kind of stitched together. It was uh, at least three different shots at uh, two different frame rates. All right, let's go on to the next shot. So this was fun. This is actually surprisingly simple. So we've got a couch, we've got a flea. I'll put some legs on it, I don't know. I guess, I guess that's a flea. And then we've got mom and the cat. So what we did was we just took some four by four uh, diffusion frames, probably 129 because once again, I'm a creature of habit and I love thick diffusion. And we put a bunch of sky panels behind them. And these are on the floor, so they're, they're low because I wanted the light to be um, coming from below because you know, TVs aren't typically, uh, well, you know, a lot of people mount TVs over fireplaces these days, personally. I hate that because you're looking up over a hot fire. Uh, I like them when they're lower. So whenever I do TVs, I always keep the light low because that, once again, low light, light from below always feels more ambient. And we just uh, set them up, uh, set one up on the uh, TV flicker effect, and then um, I think we slaved these other two, and then we basically just let them run. Now, TV flicker doesn't want to be too quick because if you watch TV, the scene changes don't happen that quickly. It'll be shot, shot, shot. So we basically set it up to have that kind of slow rhythm. And that was basically it. I think there's, there's a light, actually, there's a window in the back of the set. We popped uh, um, a hard light through that to light up this wall and just create a little sense of something back there. But otherwise, that was it. And once again, same thing, you know, shoot the flea at 24, pull the flea out, get a clean background plate, bring mom and the cat in, and then the trainer's, you know, standing somewhere over here with a, a treat on a stick, trying to get the cat to do its performance at 48 frames per second. And that was the hardest part. We would roll for, you know, 10 minutes with one cat, you know, 10 minutes with another cat and just roll continuously just trying to get this one performance. So that was one of the reasons why on this commercial, even though we had a fairly sizable budget and a lot of crew, we had to get set up very quickly because the cat needed time. All right, let's go on to the, la uh, the last shot. So this set was immediately next to the other set, and this is once again very simple. Uh, let's see, here's mom, flea, cat, cat whiskers. So uh, there's a window here in the set, and then we just brought over one of the T12s. And actually, you probably moved that over while we were shooting the other scene. That's one of the things you, you tend to start thinking about uh, when you have to shoot fast for uh, commercials and TV is uh, what can you do, what can the crew be doing now to set up for the thing you're going to be shooting after what you're currently shooting? So since that other thing was all night, it was all sky panels, while we were shooting the, the couch scene with the TV, we wheeled this around. And this is full blue. Uh, we've got the table lamp. And then we got camera. Very simple setup. Uh, the T12 was lighting the cat and basically everything in the room because we had enough spread out of the light. Uh, this light was actually a little problematic because uh, we discovered that um, I think we were sh well we were shooting at 48 with a 180 degree shutter and this light flickered. We had to go to um, let's see 144 degree shutter. Uh, because at 48, that gives us uh, 1 20th of a second exposure time, and that allowed us to sync up with um, the lamp in order to eliminate flicker. And I didn't see it on the set initially. The DIT actually came over to me at the end of the first take and said, hey, you might, you know, might want to look at this on my monitor. Uh, flicker is really insidious, and you can see it on some monitors and not others, and it all depends on the monitor and the refresh rate of the monitor. So. Uh, I always try to shoot at 144 shutter at 24 frames per second. Um, it saves me a lot of, uh, it, I get more sleep that way. Uh, because there's a lot of sources in the world now that flicker. Uh, LEDs, uh, fluorescence with failing ballasts, 
and you can't always see them on the on-set monitor, but for some reason, they always see this in post. Shall we go on to the last spot? I'm sure she thinks I'm too busy to make one. My creative secret weapon is Snapfish. They make it fun and easy to make a unique photo book. This is beautiful. Where does she find the time? So between us? Creating one-of-a-kind photo books is a snap with Snapfish. Okay, so we shot this very simply and very quickly because we had a lot to get and we had kids, as you saw. So this first shot, it, it's pretty simple. Um, let's bring up our first still. There we go. And what happened here is there's actually... Uh, there's, the camera's on a slider, and I'll show you why in a moment, and that actually plays in the next shot. Uh, we use this setup for two different shots. Uh, the first one of Mom on the computer, basically there's a medium chimera. Actually, it's probably a no, no, that's probably about right. I was going to say maybe it's a little farther around, but that's probably in, just in the right spot. Mom's looking into the camera. Um, this is a medium chimera. Uh, the S60 is 32K. Uh, the camera is 43K white balance, and this M18 in the background is 56K. So I wanted to get some more contrast into the scene because a lot of houses are very bright and cheerful. and uh, That looks great to the eye, but to the camera, it can be a little hard to create depth and separation and interest. So what I did was I just, I, I'd done this a lot. I cheated white balances. Set the camera basically between uh, tungsten and daylight, made this sky panel tungsten, and then just let this M18 HMI in the background stay at 5600. And that way, you know, mom's a little warm, uh, the background has some cool hits of light. I think part of that was because for this shot, I couldn't get the light to reach far enough into the room to really create a, a burning hot spot, but I still needed that contrast. So I decided to do it with uh, color instead of. Uh, you know, brightness. Um, this M18, I love the M18s. They really changed a lot for the industry. Uh, the M18 is a 1800 watt PAR. It's the most you can plug into a standard household so uh, socket in the US, um, US, Canada. Um, and it's got a really nice reflector on it. A lot of PARs, uh, you have to, they, they don't have flood and spot. PARs are typically just brute force lights. And there's a lens that looks kind of like a, it creates a, a, a kind of a wide oval beam, kind of like a car headlight. And if you want to change the spread, you have to swap lenses in and out. Uh, what's nice about the M18 is you can flood and spot. And the reflector is really nice. The spread is really even. And that's really important if you want to create daylight effects. Um, PARs, traditional PARs with the interchangeable lenses are great for bounce sources. But the M18 I used a lot for daylight because even though it's not going to give you super crisp, sharp shadows, um, it gives you shadows with a little bit of a soft edge to them, which I like. You know, it, it's as if the sun is coming through haze or some light clouds or something like that. Uh, I use these tons. They replaced, um, they replaced quite a lot. I mean, it used to be that at one point, if you're shooting a night exterior, you might put a 12K on a condor scissor lift, you know, on the, the next block over to light the front of the house. Um, you know, the commercials that I was shooting uh, towards the end of my freelance career, I was basically just taking an M18 and putting them on a high stand at the end of the, the driveway. That's how useful this light is. I carried these all the time. So um, that's kind of the combination here of what I was doing. Oh, I should talk about the medium chimera. Um, I don't have a lot of use for small chimeras for, for key lights because uh, I feel like I still get a lot of um, hard shadows off them. And the harder the shadow is when you light a face, the more precisely that shadow has to be placed. So if someone has a big nose, you have to move the light around in front to kind of hide, make that shadow smaller. Um, if they have deep eyes, you kind of have to get the light lower. Sometimes moving the light to where you get into the eyes does something weird to the nose. The softer the light is, the better it works on everyone. So medium chimera is up close. I used those quite a lot, and that's what I'm using here. So let's go on to the next, oh, and here we are. 
Uh, I didn't realize we got onto that shot. But uh, so you can see, here's the, what the M18 is doing. You can see that pattern. And you can see the shadows are kind of diverging, but you know, it doesn't feel exactly like um, sunlight, but it, it's close enough. It's commercial real, as we used to call it. Uh, and this is basically just the same setup. Uh, there was the shot where mom was looking right into the camera, and then there's this shot, and the only difference is we cheated this around over here to you know, give mom a little bit better modeling. Now that she was turned directly into the light, it was better to have the light over here instead. And then we just, oh, I should also talk about, uh, you know, walls and houses tend to be white. And white tends to bounce a lot of light around. And ambient light is not always that flattering on faces. So what I always did was I would set up probably a bunch of floppies, you know, black uh, duvetine, you know, solids or something to, to get in the way of that white and basically make this a black surface instead of a white surface to take as much light away as possible. And then I just bring in a little bounce card. So the light came in from where I wanted it to. Otherwise, you know, you're going to have light coming off, you know, the wall from back here, from here, and that can do weird things to a face. And what happens most often is you get a lot of fill on the side of the face, but it never gets into this eye. So if I knock all that out, and then I bring a little fill in from the front, either from here, or you could even do it from over here. In this case, since the light was so uh, close and uh, frontal, I'm pretty sure I just brought in a little bounce card from over here. But at least I can get into that eye, and I'm not creating this situation where you've got the bright side of the face, the dark side of the face, and then a really dark part of the face that nothing gets into. I really hate that look. All right, let's go on to the next shot. All right, so this is pretty simple. In fact, it doesn't get much simpler than this. Um, there was enough light coming uh, through the window and from uh, other, actually, this is, this is where mom was at the kitchen table. Uh, we just came over here. Here's the two kids. Uh, here's a window. Camera's here for a couple of shots. Just took a silver card, literally just a silver card raked it across the kids. Now, this is a situation where backlight works. I mean, backlight works in a lot of situations, especially when you're shooting uh, hands and products and small things. Uh, if you can motivate it, just having this silver card coming through the window and just popping them out and using the ambience in the room as fill, it was just a very fast, quick um, setup. And it's, you really want to prioritize your shots. For example, all the stuff with mom, that was really important, so we spent a little bit of time on that. But this is just a quick shot, a couple quick shots, the faster you can do this, the better. So by using ambient fill, adding one light to just you know, kick up their hands and you know, bring out some definition, done, move on. All right, let's, speaking of moving on, let's go to the next one. All right, so now mom was right here taking this picture. So what we did was uh, the medium chimera is now here. It was over here lighting mom. We just spun it around on her. Now I needed a little bit, I needed a way to wrap the light around in front of her. I don't always do that from the same height as the, the key that's lighting her. What I actually did was took another light and then bounced it into something down here. Let's see. Uh, I don't remember if that was warm or not. I think it was warm. One trick I used to do a lot was I would, I would put a, an apple box underneath someone and I would smack a light into it. And that gives you the sense that sunlight is hitting a hardwood floor and bouncing up on a person. I didn't want to actually do that to hardwood floors because sometimes you can damage someone's floor if you aim a really hot light into it. So I'd usually put apple boxes down there and then we'd smack something into it. And it's just a nice way to wrap light around. Like if, if this light, if this is the key light and I wanted to wrap it around with something from below, I might put an apple box just below me uh, and smack something into it. And then you'd feel this warm up light and it would just kind of taper off on the, the shadow side of the face. Let's go on to, oh, and then I should talk very quickly about the, the background. Um, pretty sure we just took the M18, still coming through this window, and just tried to light the background, which is back here. And just tried to add some texture. And this is another situation where uh, 
because we were shooting um, a quick shot of mom, to make it more convincing, I didn't mind blowing out the, the background and making it a little bit too hot. That's is one of those other instances where I looked at uh, using the light at the same level that I had in the previous shot and it didn't work, it didn't feel real. So we spotted it in, cranked it up, made it a little too hot and it's sold better as sunlight in this situation. Okay, let's go on to the next shot. All right, so this, this is fun. I always, liked, I always liked lighting food. I didn't want to do it full time, but whenever a shot came up with food, I always had a good time. Because food can be really interesting. Uh, so cupcakes, camera, handheld. Uh, and then this is just, there's just a big, it, like, well, it's probably like a four by four frame. So this is probably a little bit too big. It's probably just like that. Four by four frame with uh, sky panel going through it. And what's nice about this is, so the, the table itself or the, you know, what the cupcakes are sitting on, it's got a shiny surface. So shiny surfaces really look great if you reflect a light source in them because they, they take on that kind of strange translucent feel. I mean, you can kind of feel the presence of this light source around the cupcakes. At the same time, uh, food generally likes to be backlit because you then light the top of it and then the shadow falls off towards the front. So instead of a traditional situation like this where we might create the illusion of shape by using a source on one side and then you know shadow on the other side, uh, with a lot of food and a lot of products when you're shooting down at it, you tend to come from the top and then let the shadow fall forward towards the camera. Now, one trick with a cupcake <laughs> or any kind of food, and I spoke about this a little bit before, if, you have, if, you know, if here's your, your cupcake and you have a massive light source behind it, this is gonna start coming around the front of it and you're gonna actually wash out the front. You're not gonna have that shadow falling towards the camera. So often what I'll do is I'll start out with a big source like that and then I'll take a card and then block out some of it. So now this is the effective source lighting the cu cupcake. So now it'll light, you know, it'll wrap around the top, but it's not going to get around the front of it. So uh, I learned that from a, a DP I worked with who shot food every once in a while as part of a commercial. And uh, I really milked it. Because a lot of times in commercials, it's funny, you'll shoot... A lot of directors are so keyed into the people, they'll shoot the people first and at the, the, the end of the day they'll say, oh, let's do a quick product shot. Product shots usually take a while, so if you can figure out some tricks to speed that up, you'll make yourself look good without going into overtime. All right, let's go to the next shot. All right, so this is the oven, kids, mom, once again, I've got the silver card outside. It's on a stand, just out of shot. Um, and then cameras here, there's really not a lot going in here other than there's a sky panel on the floor and it's below and behind mom. So if, uh, if I'm mom, we're actually facing the, the wrong direction, but the mic's there, so I don't wanna face that way. Uh, if I'm facing this way, the sky panel would be down on the floor behind me so that the light is coming up and just striking the underside of my chin, the underside of my nose, just bringing out some details on my face. And that just prevents her from being too flat because otherwise this is just ambient light. I'm just using the light that's spilling around the room to light this. And if you can do that, if you can use what's there, especially if you're doing a quick shot and you don't have to worry about keeping something consistent over time, um, this can bail you out of a lot of situations because then you're just adding the accents. You know, once again, you know, you're, you're, in this case, we are working in this, this uh, big space where the living room's over here, the kitchen's here. Uh, we actually made this space very small very quickly and we had to shoot really fast. So f knowing that I had to light this area, but that I could just add accents over here really sped me up considerably. So. Uh, you know, at, at one point I was toying with the idea of putting something in the, the oven, like it was an oven light coming out, and that just felt too fake. But, and, and the light on mom is really nice. It really feels very ambient and natural, but she needed just a little bit of something. So putting a light on the floor and, you know, bringing that up a little bit uh, really helped. All right, um, I think that was the last shot. So that's about it for me. Uh, 
you know, we do a lot of great tech talks, so please, you know, keep an eye, especially on our website. Uh, if you want to check out the Airy Academy, uh, we do a lot of in, uh, instructional talks there. Um, we're really dedicated to teaching you how to use our tools, so check out our website. And um, we, at some point, we'll start doing live events right now, but right now we have a, a big uh, catalog of video events that you can work your way through. Um, and if you ever have questions, please get in touch. Uh, I'm the Cinema Lens guy, so you can uh, contact me about lens questions, but I'm also out, happy to answer your lighting questions. I'm at lenses at airy.com. And once again, my name is Art Adams. I'm the Cinema Lens Specialist in Burbank, and thank you for watching this Airy Tech Talk.